do the cost benefit analysis of if I buy this still pro for nine grand and it takes like it, it pays itself back explicitly in a year on saved labor. What if, what if you were to lose an employee during that time because they go, screw this. I don't want to work 40 hours spending 20 hours a week cleaning trays and 20 hours a week filling trays. Like this is miserable. Yeah. And the cost of that turnover, I know people say uh, hiring an employee costs something like nine months or 12 months of that employee's pay in terms of payroll and severance and uh, onboarding and training and all these things. And maybe that's true, but it, it, it does have an implicit cost there that you're not factoring in to the payback period of that piece of equipment. Welcome to the MyCareens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving MyCareens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest MyCareens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of MyCareens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Garrett Corwin from Piedmont Microgreens in North Carolina back on the podcast. Garrett recently went through a major expansion, increasing production capacity over four times. We talk about the process of planning and executing on the expansion in detail, including the different expansion options that other Microgreens farmers have available, the lessons learned from the expansion, getting GAP certification, the automation solutions Garrett recently implemented, and so much more. This is a jam-packed episode, so let's get right into it. Hey, Garrett. Welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to have you on. The other episode we had uh, last year, actually, was was an amazing episode, so I'm really excited to uh, uh, hear more about you and your farm and, and where you're at now. So thanks for coming on. Of course. Thanks for having me back, Jonah. It's always good to see your face and catch up. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, so maybe we can start just for those that haven't heard the other episode, uh, more about yourself and uh, Piedmont Microgreens and kind of, yeah, what's kind of been playing out with you over the last uh, the last year since we last had an episode. Sure. Yeah, it's funny. My farm manager, Michelle, who's off, off screen right now, she commented that I think the, your very first episode, our first episode came out just weeks before, before she was hired. So uh, it's a good like benchmark for how long it's been. Yeah. But yeah, we run Piedmont Microgreens. We're located in Durham, North Carolina. So we're close to the state capital of Raleigh. Been in business about three and a half years. We have a team of two full-time plus myself, plus a part-time. We're doing about 300 trays a week. And we recently moved out of my garage, which was 400 square feet, to our new commercial facility, which is about 1,900 square feet. And... Summer lulls right now, trying to make that jump into bigger distributors, bigger sort of grocers, retailers, things like that. But a lot of that was predicated on being GAP certified. So we got GAP certified back in May, which I think is possible probably to do out of your garage, but is probably not advisable, probably very, very hard just because the amount of safety precautions you have to have. So it was kind of something that needed to wait until we were in this commercial space. But what was nice is that we got to um, demo and reconstruct the commercial space exactly as we wanted to, which meant we could make it exactly compliant with GAP protocols. Mm. And yeah, now we're now we're looking for those bigger distributors, seeing how we can, can land bigger customers and um, you know step up in our automation and and all those fun things as well. So awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, for those that haven't seen uh, People on My Green's Instagram account, it's like a really great way to. Get a sense of the actual reality of running a microgreens business because Garrett really show showcases like all the different things that happen through the expansion process. So that's been in the works now for like I can't remember. I guess when we last spoke, you were starting to plan that out. Um, so when did yeah. you actually move in? When did you actually like get the space? And then what, how long did it take to actually from when you? Maybe I should ask when. How long did it take the, you to find the space? Uh, and then from finding the space to. Uh, um, actually like operating in and yeah. yeah well you know oliver from boston micro greens when i met him a couple of years ago the advice he gave me was as soon as you move into one space to start looking for your next one because that's just how long it takes to sort these things out and although i can admit we've been in here a couple months and i'm not i'm not thinking about the next bigger space to move into 
I think the mentality there is good in that it takes a really long time, especially in today's market, especially with the kind of space that most of us are looking for, which is in competition with all the other small business owners in the world, something that's a thousand to 2,500 square feet. That's, that's the bread and butter of the small business world. So you have a lot of competition and though that kind of real estate is just not being built anymore. The big mega Amazon warehouses are being built. Um, so I, I say that to say that I've been looking for commercial space where I was for at least a year and a half. And I found a few and gotten to different stages of the due, due diligence process before I either dropped them for some reason or generally the owners dropped us for various reasons. You know, indoor agriculture is not exactly a common or known tenant type. So we had we had gotten and this is some of these my next door neighbor is my broker. He was the seller's broker on some of these or the landlord's broker. And so he could really speak to my character and what we were doing and that we were doing it right and that we wouldn't flood a commercial space or, you know, inoculate the walls with mold. Um, nonetheless, some some owners just don't want to lease to an indoor farm because it's just weird. It's just uncertain. So we've yeah. been dropped a few times because of that. We had others that we had lost out because somebody else had what's called right of first refusal. You know, we get along in the process and another tenant, another um, business might be the first one that can say whether they want the space or not. And it's only if they say no, do we then get to take a chance at it? And we lost some because other tenants wanted the spaces that we wanted. So we've been looking for a space for about a year and a half. And I had looked into buying another home only to rent out the rooms and use another garage as a second farm location. I had looked into upfitting shipping containers to buying land or leasing land and starting a market garden since I have that background as well. So I looked into every type of expansion. I, I even contracted two people who operated in the forage mushroom space since Asheville, since Western North Carolina has a strong foraging scene to see if we could be a broker, if we could be a middleman for foraged goods to our chefs. So, I mean, we really looked at everything and we could not find commercial space until finally um, this commercial space, this unit, which is one unit in a broader like 10 unit building, went up for sale with the unit next to us. And so working with my parents, we were able to buy both units. Just that's what you have to do in real estate sometimes, even though we didn't want both, we had to. So we bought both units and released the the second unit, which actually I guess back to my point on Oliver is nice because we're both on three lease three year leases. Um obviously we're the we're the owner and the operator, so we can just keep yeah. releasing to ourselves. But it means that in three years, when their lease is up, we can expand next door. Mm -hmm. Um so we this this unit went up for sale in I want to say October. We closed in roughly November, and we started the process of vetting general contractors and getting to work with an architect to start to mock up blueprints and things like that. Then I went on away on vacation for December, and most of the world just shuts down in December, and the tenant was still in here until December thirty first, and then roughly mid January is when. We sort of picked our general contractor, went through the iterations of our design plan. Um, I'm sure I talked to you at that point. I'm sure I talked to Mike Rakers at that point and other people sort of finalized that design and got to work, I want to say early to mid-February. And the whole demo process and renovation process was about eight weeks. So oh, then we were... We had our certificate of occupancy uh, April 13th or mid-April, which gave us about four weeks to then prepare for our gap audit, which was mid-May. And now we've been in here, gap certified for a month and a half, and in here operating for whatever that makes it, two and a half months. Yeah. Um, it's so, all very new. Yeah, relatively. We're, we're kind yeah. of... We're kind of um, there's no more like active pursuit of like more racks and where do we put these things? You know, like when you move into a new house or a new apartment, you're like, okay, obviously the couch goes here, but then you spend two months. You're like, what drawer do I want to put the silverware in? Cause it's all those little details. Yeah. So now we're in the like refinement stage where we're labeling stuff and tweaking, you know, where stuff is stored or how we operate or like the, the little things. Yeah, for sure. I think first off, I think it's for, for many people, they may be, 
uh, shocked at the length of time the the process can take. Um, and it's it, it, there's multiple factors here. There's like how like how ready are you to move? So when you started a year and a half, I think it, you it sounds like you were more uh, planning it, knowing that you wanted to go that route rather than like I'm ready to move a year and a half ago. Is that is that correct? Or are you ready to move? Like, would you if you found a space right away a year and a half ago mm. uh, when you started the mm. process, would you have moved it right away? Is is a good question to ask to help people gauge I, how long the process is. Two two answers. One, if you do recall a conversation we had, which was that I a year and a half, two years ago, was like I was using the theory of of limiting constraints, and I said. If my do- if my orders doubled today, I would not have enough space in my garage to fulfill on those. I would kill myself doing it, but I could work double time and produce those orders. Um, therefore, space is my limiting constraint, yeah. and I should continue to preserve my money and not hire someone and hire them once I find the space because the space is the the bottleneck. Yeah, and and we had a conversation. He said, "Do you really want to be hiring, training, etc.? Somebody new." while in a new space freaking out about sales and new overhead and all these things and it was great advice because i ended up expanding our sales in our garage finding more ways to produce more sell more i ended up having a team of two full-time people or two full-time equivalents before we moved out of the garage so i'm very happy that i hired before i moved and continued to like it was a it was a blessing in disguise to not yeah not find the space right away because I thought we would cap out in the garage at like $3,000 a week and then $3,500 a week and then 4,000. And at one point I think we hit $5,000 a week, um, which is pretty insane to think you can grow a yeah. quarter million dollars produce in a 400 square foot garage. Um, so it, it forced us to be creative to buy more sales outlets and, and fit more racks in and, and be creative and also gave me a less stressful context to hire and train people. And now I do practically none of the farming yeah, um, I help with harvest, but I don't. I don't really plant or water, and like that's because I've had my employees now for probably a year on average. That um, so we we would have been ready to move, but I'm glad that we didn't. I, I think it gave us a, a a longer runway to train people to, excuse me, put away more money, things like that. Yeah, for sure. I I, I think that that was a good perspective because um, like a lot of people want to be go go go. Uh, especially mm-hmm. when the, when the potential for sales come up, uh, but mm-hmm. I've seen just in the consulting work uh, I've done that some people get caught in a situation where they're they're not ready for for like what 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 the reality of of an expansion can be. Um, mm-hmm. And so the more prepared you are, which it sounds like you're pretty pretty well prepared to 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 expand. And part of that was like you said, a blessing in disguise that it did take longer than you probably would have wanted to because it you know it. It's it's hard to not want to expand when when like sales are going up and you know it's it's just like a natural uh, mentality we have as as entrepreneurs like there's an yeah. opportunity we want to capture that opportunity um, and usually that's the case but you know there's times where if if you didn't have employees and um, you know you you also would be a year and a half less of having growing experience so you probably have more issues understanding the best uh, you know the growing environment and uh and dealing with customers and and issues that come up like the more experience you have going into that expansion the more uh, capital you have saved up as well makes it a lot lot less stressful because um usually these expansions and you you can uh uh, touch on this are like in my experience they're they're any construction uh is going to be more expensive and then on the flip side you usually people are very optimistic on you know how much can be done in a period of time and it usually takes longer um, on both the production side and the sales side, it usually is like a, a mix of, of both that can be more challenging. Um, but yeah, so like, I, I don't know if, if like, the, what, it sounded like you hired a general contractor. Did you find that they were pretty good to stay on budget? Or did you find that like there was always took longer, cost more, that sort of thing than, than you originally planned? Yeah, so some some uh background some context is my family and the like background and privileges i have because my family are incredibly helpful um both because my parents are entrepreneurs so just having that support and the relatability and the ability to seek advice from them but my dad's also a commercial developer so 
as far mm-hmm. as construction and real estate is concerned, I, I wouldn't have been able to vet these units, purchase them, release them, um, you know, know the right questions to ask general contractors as I vetted them. It was, you know, I, I would have fumbled my way through it and gotten through it, but it, if not for my parents, it would have been way harder. Um, so that's one. And then two, as they say in construction, like with many things, you kind of have time, cost, and scope. And, you know, pick two or one of them's bound to go off the rails. You're going to go out of scope or out of budget or over time. And we ended up vetting four or five GCs, general contractors, and narrowed it down to three. Two of them were smaller fish. One of them was sort of the, the big guy in town, the big company in town. All their bids came back. Um, and as you know, I'm happy to share numbers. So the two smaller teams came back at 125,000. And weirdly for how big that number is, those two bids came back within $50 of each other. Wow. Um, huh. and then the third one, because they were much bigger, they just have more overhead, it just takes more to mobilize their teams to do admin. So they came in, I think at like 150,000 and myself without any construction background but an ability to make a reasonable guess and my dad with a development background despite the fact that he's in california so much more expensive market we both thought those bids were going to come back like fifty sixty thousand dollars tops because all we were doing was taking a flex yeah. space that had six or seven ten by ten offices with some some you know kind of crappy carpet and a drop ceiling and just just tear it all out and throw down epoxy and some extra electrical and plumbing and you basically just have a yeah. you know fancy box. Um, so we were both stunned that they came back so high. Um, but that is the state of the world, the state of supply chains, construction, trades, jobs. Everything's more expensive in today's world. Um, we were on budget almost to the T, despite a few changes that we made. And we were actually ahead of schedule by about two weeks. Oh, wow. So that was that was nice. Um, we had a really, really good general contractor. If you guys go back and watch watch my videos, you'll see what I talk about. You'll see what I talk about in terms of how you know you have a good GC. You know, they leave the construction site clean. Uh, they communicate well. They kind of take ownership of communication errors that end up being a little costly. You know, things with permitting that have outcomes that would otherwise mean expenses to us that they ate sometimes. So, yeah, it it, it ended up. Aside from the cost, which seems like there was, we, we could have tried to walk back our scope a little bit to bring the cost down from 120000 to something more reasonable. But in the end, you, you can't really. I mean, we could have kept like one of the offices up front, but then that would have long-term eaten to our ability to grow more product. Yeah. The resale value, if we ever move out and release or sell, it probably doesn't preserve the resale value there. We could have cut our electrical in half. So straight across from me on this wall, we have um, nine banks of outlets for nine rack systems. And each of those has a quad outlet up top and a quad outlet below. So we could have like cut out the whole bottom set of quad outlets, but we need those. Like eventually yeah. we will need those. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, do you want that cost now or do you want, do you want it later? And then yeah. later all your, all your plants are going to be in the way. Like, so. <laughs> You yeah. could have walked it back, but we probably would have been able to, it would have been a big compromise to us long term. And we probably would have only been able to reduce the cost from like 120 to 100, which 20,000 is, is decent, but like in the grand scheme, just pay for what you want. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Like when, when I moved into the first facility, I really should have had uh, six tons minimum of air conditioning. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's so starting to add up. Like, do I really need it? Like I start like, like questioning something that was like advice given to someone I trust uh, well, that wasn't, wasn't, uh, they weren't a, um, a HVAC contractor, but they know a lot about like growing indoors. And they sure. told me um, like, you should, you should, you should at least do six ton in our climate. And I was like, I'll save like, and it wasn't like looking back, it was like back then it was like maybe $2,000 or something, maybe 3000. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and and I decided like you know no I don't need it and then when I got the second unit I had to cut a hole in the in the in, in the dividing wall to get airflow mm-hmm. that into that unit because it, uh-huh. it just couldn't it couldn't keep up so I had 
what, and that costs way more <laughs> than the $3,000 yeah. to uh, cut a hole in the wall, put venting from and upsize the next uh, uh, HVAC unit. Ducting, yeah. Ducting, yeah, like ducting is not cheap. So it's just like you can either spend it now and it'll most likely be less expensive or you can spend later and spend more because one, to redo it while you have the farm in place, it's going to be more disruptive, as you said, but also yeah. uh, like it's going to be more expensive for smaller jobs. Plus over time, as we've seen with like everything, uh, it's going to get more expensive. So yeah. uh, I think it's the right decision to spend a little bit more now, knowing that you have a plan to expand in the future. And uh, and then also makes it easier to expand quickly when you get a big customer, because like you're yeah. ready to go. You can buy some racks, put the lights on, start growing. Yeah. Like, it'll be pretty smooth sailing to have a quick expansion. Whereas like if your electrician is like busy and you have to wait four weeks, that yeah. customer may not be, maybe they'll go find someone else or something like that. So yeah. there's a, a lot yeah. of factors at, at play there. Um, so it sounds like you had some, some really great uh, uh, head starts with like picking out a, con uh, a, a GC and like finding the right real estate. Your original plan was not necessarily to buy, correct? Was it, was, it was to rent and it just became too difficult in the current market to find a place. And then the one that came up to buy became available is that or, or were you planning to buy originally as well so remember these are the conversations that i have with my dad very smart guy if you're old enough to know the context we call him rain man because he doesn't forget anything he knows everything <laughs> like back two two and a half three years ago when we started this conversation the question was really do we lease or buy a commercial space and retrofit it for indoor production or do we go find land kind of outside the county and build a custom facility. Yeah. Which, you know, in retrospect is insane to go from my 400 square foot garage to spending six or seven figures on a groundbreaking project that will take multiple, like, right. The, the jump there was absolute hubris to think that that yeah, was possible. Yeah. Um, but the logic there was you go in and, and um, whether you're leasing or buying a commercial space, you're, you're, you're retrofitting it for, a very specific purpose, which whenever you do something in real estate for a very specific purpose, you are almost always devaluing it. So mm -hmm. if we go to re like if we go to release or sell this this unit that I'm in, it will appreciate because that's how real estate is. But we have sort of intrinsically devalued it because somebody who like there's very few tenants, very few industries that want what we've done here. Most people, most industries want what was here, which is some offices, a little bit of warehouse for storage of product or, or inventory or whatever. And so the logic originally was, well, if we're going to um, sort of adulterate or, or ruin a space by making it really specific for indoor agriculture, let's just go do it on our own terms, on our own land in a way that it's like very, like we're, we're going to specifically bottleneck ourselves into a farming indoor ag context. Yeah. Without any concern for recouping that value in like a maximizing way in the future. Whereas when you go to buy like a small business unit like this, unless you are adamant, which nobody knows that like five, 10, 20, 50 years from now, I may want to sell this place. It's going to be hard to find a tenant. Or it's going to be hard to find a buyer who's like, yes, epoxy floors, you know, nine tons of HVAC and more electrical outlets than I know what to do with. Like just people don't want that. So um this was the option that presented it to us to presented to us. And I'm a big fan of real estate. Clearly my dad is. Um and so it just made sense both to win the ability to buy or lease the property. We had to buy it. That's just the competitive landscape. And um and it it just yeah, it just kind of worked out that way. Um yeah. it was the option that was presented to us. We like real estate. We know real estate, and yeah, it was a risk. I mean, it's a, yeah. a risk to uh, modify the space in this way, but it's just the risk you have to take when having or growing a business. For sure. So I would think of it a little differently. I, I think you you are like I don't think you're devaluing the property in my like your dad's a real estate expert, so he knows a lot more yeah. than me. But just yeah, like yeah. my 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 mindset on this because I've leased uh, you know commercial space and um, and you know so I have a not a, a, a amazing understanding, but like, if you just think about it, if you put that, that HVAC in, um, it's not like some, there's no disadvantage 
to someone having that. There's no disadvantage of having more outlets. Maybe the office space, having less office space would be a disadvantage that you have to rebuild if you wanted to rent it out. But all that stuff, you need to run the business. So whether you rented a space sure. or bought the space, you would still need that HVAC, you would True. still need those outlets. So they may be of value to someone, but they may not be of any value to someone else, um, which, which means at the very least, you had to buy them anyway, so you still needed them. Um, so it's not it's not reducing the usable it, it, the office. I think the office yeah, space yeah. definitely is because I, I yeah. agree. Like most units I found were if it's like thirty percent office, but you really only want ten percent for a farm because you don't need that much office space. Then you have this like space that's not really used for production, and the most valuable part for uh, a microgreens farm or vertical farm, whatever, is the indoor is the actual warehouse production space. So there's yeah. like a, a a change in that, but all the upgrades don't hurt. But they may not benefit, but they may benefit. Yeah, I think I think it's business. like I think there's two categories. There's there's the the, the rebuild cost. Yeah. Um, most small businesses probably want some office space between like twenty and sixty percent. So yeah, the rebuild cost of rebuilding those offices and any you know cost for the walls or putting down flooring or whatever. And then there's the sort of implicit cost of if we use a really extreme example, we say. Yeah, we as an indoor farm have a much higher demand for HVAC and therefore we need two five ton units or something. Right? The same space would only need for a normal office use, but it's not a huge heat load, would only need four tons. Yeah. Well, to operate and maintain and service the two HVAC units. Got it. You know, there might be some implicit cost there to just running um running all that electrical on a like yeah, just like implicit minor costs. So yeah. And, and yeah. just, it's just, um, it's just more work, right? If, if, even if we said, Hey, we want to release this space and we have 20 people say, yeah, we're, we're kind of interested, but we need office. Well, now there's just a ton of friction there to say, okay, we'll, we'll rebuild the office for you before you, um, you move in to, to lease this space. Yeah. But the friction there of like, if the office isn't already here, then it's going to be harder to attract potential tenants. I sure. can't see the potential of having office space, or they have to wait for us to build those offices, or so just like other friction and yeah, yeah, um, no, for sure. Obviously, we hope that our business thrives and we yeah. never release it and we expand the adjacent unit and all these things. But when you go to buy real estate, you just you have to think about the exit. So yeah, for sure, no, hundred percent. Like I look back at uh, if if I when I started renting in twenty fifteen. If I had the opportunity, which in my local market, it's very hard to buy commercial real estate because they're all owned by these like rental uh, corporations. Yeah. Uh, but if you could buy it, like the value of that would have been like, you know, I'll, I'll, like by sell if I sold, if I bought it, then sold it when I sold the business in 2023 over that eight year period. And maybe this is an unusual situation, but that real estate probably went up two and a half times in that period. Yeah. Which is yeah. kind of like so, like the returns can be kind of you could have uh, like doubled doubled your your exit. Yeah, yeah, pretty like much. It, it, I, if you have wait long enough. Yeah, exactly. And I actually have a, a family member who um, had a uh, you know just like like a like chemical cleaning business, and he mm -hmm. he sold the business for like a relatively small amount, but he owned the real estate, so he bought the real estate. And again, mm -hmm. this was like going back to like the eighties or something. So it's very, sure. like the, he, the like 90% of what he made was on the real estate, not on yeah. the business. So yeah. having said that, it wasn't like a big business that was super profitable sort of thing, but sure. you know, the real estate is generally speaking, a pretty good long-term play. Bet, it's like yeah. another form of investment for a lot of people. So having that on top of having a, a migraines business is great. And like, I've done consulting where like people ask me like, should I build? And I say, like if you can, if you can afford mm -hmm. it and you have the time to commit to like the project of building, like yeah. it's a business in and of itself, but yeah. like you get the benefit of having an asset at the end of the day when you, when you eventually want to sell the business or stop offering the business, whatever it is. Whereas if you just like, I've seen, I see a lot of micro farms that are small, they, they end the business because they, for whatever reason, um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of micro business start and stop and start and stop. Sure. Um, those businesses, like they just sell the the actual trays and lights yeah they're not selling the operations um but if they have yeah. like some sort of real estate play in there then they'd have like uh, a built asset uh when they exit so even even if the business itself yeah. is not a sellable asset um but m most people obviously don't have the resources to you know always buy, be able to buy yeah i think between you and me we could probably 
talk through the continuum of business as an asset, right? At the like you said at the beginning, and, and we bought one of our competitors two years ago. Yeah, they were doing like one or two local markets, and then they had like seven or eight chefs. And when it came down to it, they didn't have a sellable business. So kind of like at the for, for anybody considering buying or selling their business at the lowest tier, you're just buying an introduction to a client or a client yeah. list. And that's what we, we pretty much just paid them a thousand bucks. We said, I don't, I don't want your stuff. Um, you don't have a sellable business. I don't want your employee, right? I don't want your brand. Um, I just want the 10 restaurants that you, that you sell to. And you're kind of just paying them like a fixed cost for an introduction. Yeah. Um, for them, it was pretty much the value that the expenses that they were going to incur in shutting down. I, I figure, you know, you guys are need a U-Haul. You have to clean up your commercial space. You're probably going to pay, you know, um, disposal fees, whatever. Um, and I think I paid them like a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks. They introduced me to eight or nine of their clients. A few of them stuck. A few of them we never got. Uh, we never, you know, kind of consistently landed. And that's fine. And then the next is what you mentioned, which you see on Facebook a lot when people shut down is that they're just selling their assets or their equipment. Um, Hey, I got, you know, 300 trays. I got five racks. I got, you know, X, Y, Z other things who wants them. And you sell it off at 50% at best of what you paid for it. And then obviously I haven't sold my business, so I can't, or a business, so I can't speak to it. You can, but then the next year is you have enough team, you have enough systems, you have enough uh, dependability in your clients and enough leftover profit that, um, like what you did with Living Earth, you can then sell an actual business rather than a list or equipment that you have yeah. a sort of full circle thing that either doesn't depend on you as the owner or depends on you very little. As I said, I don't really do much of the farming anymore. I do admin and sales and outreach and marketing. Um, and depending on how good your business is, how much profit you have, how, how much it depends on you and how much it can grow without you, you can get more or less for that. Um, yeah. And then I would say the third, the fourth tier is, is the real estate. Like if you own the real estate, great. Um, and you can maybe sell the real estate with it. And maybe that's something I would end up doing if I ever sold PMG or if PMG is good and I want to sell PMG, um, but I want to hold on to the real estate. Then if, if I believe in the future ability for PMG to continue operating and making money, yeah. then I can be pretty confident that the new owner is going to be able to continue paying the rent. And so then I just collect on that rent, yeah. um, even though I've disposed of PMG. So you kind of get a short-term cash payout um, or payout, and then you get a just long-term um, real estate rental money. So yeah, that's yes, it's much harder. Way. It's much harder to figure out to get the yeah. real estate, but you get those kind of like three or four tiers of of uh, selling a business. Yeah, no, that's I think that's a that's a great way to think of it for people that you know the the the, the, the full spectrum of what options are available for people. Um, and the good thing is like, you know, as a farm, there is a lot more uh, grants available and or mm -hmm. uh, easier to access loans. So, for example, where I am, mm -hmm. um, you still need to uh, uh, get approved, but you don't need the same income levels to get like if you let's say you want to buy an outdoor farm. Um, there's yeah. a company, there's a, a, a institution called Farm Credit Canada that uh, mm -hmm. you still have to put 20 percent down because they don't they're, they're not just like throwing out loans left and right. Um but you don't need to have the same necessarily income uh, mm -hmm. support compared to like, you know, buying a, another type of business because they want to support people uh, uh, getting farms. So there is more opportunity and more uh, easier access to capital uh, through these type of organizations, which I'm sure there's in, through the USDA and other organizations in the US. I can imagine there's probably even more in the US than in Canada because there's a lot more support for farmers. Um, so those type <laughs> of things are available for anyone that, you know, Maybe like, oh, how, how am I going to afford to, you know, do something yep. like this? So it, it just gives more um, opportunity uh, to people that may think, listening to this conversation, how would that ever be possible for me? Like as an example. Yeah. So just, I, I wouldn't think of it in solely in those terms, but that there is a lot of opportunity for farms, whether it's grants, loans, et cetera, um, that are available. And it's just a matter of finding out what they are. And if you, as your business can apply for them. Yeah. yeah. and without going down this rabbit hole, there also is because indoor farming, microgreen farming, urban farming, all those um, buzzwords are still pretty niche. Like the USDA is getting better at offering grants yeah. and loans, and things like that to people like us. There is always seller financing. Um, if you're looking to sell yeah. and or buy, if you can work that out with the 
owner of the business. I don't know if that's something you did or if you want to share, no. but, um, yeah. but it's offering, an yeah. yeah. So like to, to your point, somebody, if somebody wanted to come to me and say, Hey, I'll give you 10% of your, your asking price. If you can seller finance the remaining 90% at whatever, 8%. Yeah. Um, and again, if, if I'm confident that PMG and the new owner are going to continue on doing well, then I have the best, most perfect knowledge of the business. And I should, you know, like there's no, there's no information ambiguity or asymmetry yeah. there where I'm like, ah, I mean, if I believe in the new buyer, then I'd be like, yeah, I know PMG is going to continue to produce profits and it's just going to come back to me as the seller um, and I get interest on it. So there's yeah. always options. Yeah. 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 I, I think more people should look into that. If you want to get into it and you have a business background or you have confidence in your ability to run a business, I think more people should try to reach out to existing farm owners and either try to buy into a farm in, in full or in part, like become co-owner in an existing farm or yeah. buy, buy an existing farm out, right? Yeah. Absolutely. After going through the process of selling my farm, like I realized how much easier it is to buy a business in the sense of like, you don't have to learn everything from scratch. Like you have someone mm -hmm. that own the business that can transfer that knowledge to you. Ideally, they'd have staff that know most of the business operations. And then it's just like the most important task that you're tackling. Um, I think seller financing. Um, so I didn't do seller financing, but seller financing is something that ideally you, you, you want you like as a, as a seller, you, you mm -hmm. only necessarily want to do it. Like you said, if you have like full confidence in the person mm -hmm. buying the business, because you have no idea like what's going to happen and you're putting a lot of the risk on you, you, you become the bank. Um, yeah. so you know, you're putting a lot of risk on you. So for some people that might, might be okay. Um, but from my experience, that's generally like an option, uh, people trying to sell a business do if they struggle to sell the business, that's not always sure. the case. It could be like a small percentage of sell, sell financing yeah. because the buyer wants to yeah. have some confidence that the business, that, 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 that the, that the seller thinks the business will continue to operate uh, well. So there's like, there's a lot of complexity there. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, but um, yeah, I think, I think this is like, I think very helpful for people to get a sense of like, what are the options in expanding um, what mm -hmm. that process uh, looks like um, in terms of like, you know, after going through this process over the last, let's say year and a half from, from when you started, mm -hmm. um, do you have any like, you know, main lessons you've learned or, or challenges you've you faced that you wish you knew something before that could help others going through the same kind of process of going from uh, growing in their house to potentially getting a commercial facility in the near future. I think I would just consolidate what I've already said, which was is really just advice that I've got from you and others that were ahead of me, which is um, probably higher higher and have some degree of systems not automation, but just systems on how you do things, hire people, have at least one, if not more employees before you expand out of your, your garage or your basement. And maybe that's, you know, I'm obviously at this solo or I'm a solo owner. Um, a lot of people get into this with their significant other. So maybe you could push off hiring someone until after you expand, but it's, it takes, it takes a lot longer to solve people problems than it does production problems. Yeah. Like you're, your hiring process is going to take at best a month for a farm assistant position, if not a couple months. We have a lot of universities around here, so it's, it's relatively easy to hire. Um, but just like training people, teaching them, right? It's, we don't label our trades. Like trying to teach our newest hire that we hired eight weeks ago. Like, yeah, this is celery. It is different than parsley. They are both umbels. This is how you distinguish them out of germination. We're not going to label all like the way we do, you know, so a lot of it is just yeah. background knowledge on farming, on identification, on, Things that are really hard to um, pick up on, like we all know, we all know yeah. watering is very intuitive um, unless you have an automation system. And so, just people problems take longer than production problems. Like you can probably pretty fast figure out why X Y Z thing is not growing well. It's probably because your seeds are old or your temperature is too high. Or, like those things can be solved kind of with a little bit of money in an instant. Yeah, people people problems take longer. So oh, yeah. I would say hire hire before you move, and. Um, it's it's going to take twice as long, cost twice as much, at least. Um, you know, the one hundred twenty five thousand, hundred twenty thousand we spent on the remodel, that was just on the infrastructure. That does not include the additional twenty or twenty five thousand I spent on getting the Stilt Pro potting machine, buying a pallet's worth of bootstrap farmer trees, 
buying a pallet's worth of uh, racks and lights. And, you know, some of those we have not touched and will not touch for months because I just, I wanted the discount of a bulk buy. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure that production was on our bottleneck. But even if you don't do that, you're going to be spending on, like, we have a lot of just utility racks now, like just racks on wheels that we move to, because our, our, our space is now 75 feet long or 100 yeah. feet long. And so there's just a lot more move. Like there's just things that you, it's not, it's not only you need more of the same, you need more trays, more lights, more zip ties, more, but you also need more of new stuff. You know, we, uh, we, I'm trying to, I'm looking around trying to think about like clipboards and, and you know, some of this is gap for gap stuff, but like clipboards for all of our record keeping, we need, uh, I, I, I joke with my employees, but, for the longest time, I just operated out of my bedroom, out of my my desk and my desk chair that I had from school. And so when I bought us folding chairs, we like had, we, we jokingly celebrated. We're like, great, we have a place to sit. Like stupid stuff yeah. that we have a chem cabinet, um, a chemical cabinet that that is lockable. Uh, you know, for Gap, you have to supply water, uh, potable water, which again, sounds stupid. But when you're operating out of your house, it's just, it's not something you think about. Yeah. Uh, trash cans and trash cans on casters so they're easy to move and clocks on the wall like just, just all sorts of stuff that yeah. adds up um so things will take twice as long they'll cost twice as much people problems take a lot longer to solve than production problems and yeah i think i think that's oh, it yeah. I think get, get, get 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 gap certified if you can do it before well even if you get GAP certified in your garage or your basement, probably not possible, probably really difficult, but GAP is applicable to the space, not the business. So it doesn't matter if you get GAP certified when you move, you'll have to get re-audited. So. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. Same with, cool. uh, same with FDA, not FDA, uh, F, FSA, Farm Service Agency. Um, when you get a farm and track number, which is what you need to get um, to apply for like USDA grants and loans. Yeah. Um, that is also site specific, not business specific. So it was something we could have done, but now it's something we do for this space with a lease from PMG to the LLC. Yeah. Um, yeah. Trying no, I think, money people. I, I think that's how, yeah, no, I think that's, that, that, that's definitely helpful for, for people. Uh, Cause I think the, the mindset people have is like, I, like, like, cause before you've ever, if you've never hired someone and been an employer, it's hard to really mm -hmm. understand what that, what that entails. There's, there's a mm. lot to it. Like, there, it so, is. so, so, uh, there's like all the regulation you have to follow. And like, you're, you as the business owner are responsible for knowing what those rules are. As an example, Ooh, like, yeah. someone, someone told me, uh, I went, I went to Living Earth recently and I found out that apparently, like, volunteers are not like a thing that's allowed in, in my province anymore because it's like, like you, you have to, you have to be compensated as, as, as doing work. Like if you're, if right. you're like, if you're volunteering as it, it's, it starts getting very complicated. So yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't, I don't know the exact specifics, but I was like, Oh, that's interesting. So like the volunteer program that uh, I, I, I created may not be applicable anymore yeah. to like, you know, depending on where you are. So there's things like the things change on top of mm -hmm. like the base regulations. So there's like all sorts of laws that have changed in the last 10 years regarding yeah. employment, employment, at least where I am. And, and I'm sure yeah. most places that you have to just as an employer, that's, that's a, part of your role. yeah. And that's a really good point. That was one of the, one of the, another hidden benefit of, of things that we learned and got set up before we moved, yeah. right? Hiring, hiring someone, learning the difference between a contractor and a W2 employee. Yeah. And when you have to actually hire someone as W2. And then when you do, you need to hire a payroll company and then you need workers comp and then you need, like, you know, if you want to offer 401k matching or other types of benefits, then you have OSHA regulations and trainings to consider. Thankfully, as a farm, most of us have uh, food safety considerations and not so much OSHA considerations, but there's still some. Uh, but all those things got sorted before we moved. And it was a pain in the ass yeah. to deal with payroll. There are like three companies that have been around for a century and they're so archaic and so terrible to work with. We use paychecks. There's one person of the like nine people that have the nine different departments that we work with that is competent. And I just go to him wow. for everything, even if it's not relevant to his department, but like it, it, it's, it was such, it was such a, a headache, but now it's sorted. Yeah. And it's we sorted sort of it out before we moved. Yeah. And it just goes back to like, 
employees before expansion because payroll and the legality, like you said, and rules and regulations are just so much more amorphous and take longer to learn. And frankly, they're just more stressful. Like if you read the Facebook forms, a lot of the questions people ask repeatedly are like about cottage, uh, cottage house laws and what you can grow and sell out of your home and food safety. And people get paranoid about the Department of Ag and the Department of Health. And if they're, if someone's going to come knocking on their door randomly one day, yeah, yeah. they're never going to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like just get that stuff sorted because you'll have plenty of other stressors when you get into a much bigger space with taxes and insurance and higher rent or rent for the first time. Like a, a small piece of advice, if you're, if you're using your garage or basement, pay yourself rent, like have your business pay you rent. Um, my business paid me, the owner, $400 a month to rent plus compensation for the utilities. Um, you just get used to it. Yeah. Uh, like you're going to have that. So, yeah, just something to keep in mind. I, again, this it's different in every place, but yeah, there yeah. are tax implications of potentially paying yourself rent in the sense of like, if let's say you have a house uh, and using it for business purposes, some like in Canada, if you do that and then you sell the property, some of the gain may be applicable to uh, mm. what would rent it out. So there's certain like things like that, yeah. that uh, uh, could apply. So people should definitely look into that before uh, fully yeah. just going into that, but it is yeah. an, <laughs> a good option, right? I think it's, I think it's a good option. People can have that can reduce their like, you know, potential uh, have income coming in on the personal side. And then the business is uh, like, you know, cause you are using the space for business. So that's the way it really should be, but it's whether and, it makes sense for you to do that. And so, but, but I think the yeah. point, the point is, is that like, you know, understand what your options are uh, as, yeah. as, as the business so that you can decide uh, what makes the most, the most sense for, for someone to do. Right. I, I think, um, I think what I want people to understand is to treat the business like a business. Yeah. And no business, unless you're a solopreneur operating an e-commerce business or something entirely digital where you'll never have rent because you'll never need a commercial space. You will eventually need commercial space. You will eventually be paying someone, whether it's like my context, my business to my LLC rent, you're going to be paying rent. So get used to it. And when you go to sell that business, like if the buyer sees that you have never considered rent, like I own this space. If I just said I own the space, so PMG, I'm not going to make PMG pay me rent. If yeah. I wanted to sell the business, somebody's going to go, wait, you should be paying rent of thirty five hundred dollars. If you sell me the business and not the real estate, I'm going to have to pay you thirty five hundred dollars a month in rent. Like, yeah. if that's not factor in, then your value of your business, it's just like just treat it like a business. A hundred percent. And a, a really good example is when we bought Carolina Microgreens two years ago. Um, they didn't have a sellable business because it wasn't a sellable business. We paid them for their client list. But one of the arguments they made to me because I said I tried to value their business off of legit principles of you know, net profit and margins and what my margins were applied to their business and all these things. And they're like, wait, your, your net margins are whatever they were at the time, like 32%. They're like, our net margins are 50. How is that all else being equal? How's that the same? It's like, cause you have two people, you know, husband and wife that are working in the business and you are not paying yourself because yeah. you have other jobs with UNC. So you don't have an accurate reflection of your own business. Somebody, myself or one of my employees, has to do that labor when we buy the business. And and so both of these are just like, yeah, yeah, pay yourself, pay rent, do the things that any business, if you didn't have a home to host your business in, to, to house your business, you would have to do anyway. Um, maybe if you can't pay that, that like ghost rent right away, don't, but like get to a point where you're fully considering all the costs yeah. of running your business. For sure. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, th I think that's one of the most common things I see especially with first time business owners, specifically, obviously I deal with, with micro owners is they're not truly considering what their time is worth um, in, in two aspects. And one from a like, okay, I'm just going to do everything myself because like, I don't want to either hire anyone, which don't get me wrong. I was totally in that position. I think a lot of yeah. people are, because it, it can be scary to start going down that road of hiring people. Um, but also from the perspective of like, as the business owner, are you really utilizing your time in the best possible way to grow this business efficiently? Mm -hmm. So if you're doing like seating 
and soul mixing and that sort of stuff. Like that, if you can hire someone to do that for, let's say $20 an hour and you can go get more sales, which is maybe worth hundreds of dollars an hour of your time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, are you really value? Are, are you really doing what makes the most sense to do? And then a lot of people like calculate their costs without considering their labor. I think that's one of the most common mm -hmm. things I see in, in, in my greens is they're like, okay, like I'm, I have 85% margins on, on my microgreens. And it's like yeah. the biggest cost of production, like is like, like you know, is, is, is labor, uh, and then, you know, supplies. So, um, and then rent, like, those are the three biggest, you know, portions and labor for most farms, especially if you're not automated, labor. will be the highest one. Um, labor. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So By if you're far. not to labor, are you really like figuring out mm -hmm. your correct, uh, uh, margins? And it's fun, you know, if you're growing 20 trays or something, you don't, you don't need to worry about that necessarily. But like, if you're trying to turn it into like a, a yeah. larger scale business that's producing your full-time income, you need to account for that. Cause like, that's where you see people selling microgreens for like, you know, $4, uh, uh, you know, a clamshell sort of thing retail. And it's like, mm -hmm. cause they haven't figured, they haven't realized like what their time is worth. So those type of farms generally don't last super long. Cause they're like, they, they, they have 85% margins, but then they have like, they don't consider that they are the labor. And that yeah. needs to be accounted for. That's not a business. Yeah. That's a job. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's just a distinction between that and understanding that I think is 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 really really important uh, for uh, for taking your business to where it needs to go to be a business and not just a job for your for yourself. Which is not like Absolutely. nothing against that. Like there's no, no nothing wrong with that. It's just to understand that and become aware of what that actually is. There's a a great. I, I think it's a it's a course or a, like a webinar by Andy Massaw and the microgreen farmer. I don't know his name, but um, they talk about, I, I think the whole webinar is structured around Andy talking about his experience working his way through two or three commercial spaces at this point. Um, I think he's about to or has just moved into another commercial space. And this is just sort of the advertising video that they recorded. I didn't join the course, but they had a, a perfect graph that I wish I could find uh, off the cuff. And it's... it's um, I think it's like number of trays and revenue or something. And it's this, it's this graph of like, when you start out, you're all alone. You have no labor. Um, microgreens are a lucrative yeah. hustle, side hustle. But as soon as you start to hire people, that, that take home pay for you as the owner goes down. And it might pop up a little bit if you have a little bit of like a part-time hire, but you're still in your, your garage where you don't have a lot of overhead. Yeah. But then you, you better be, you better have a plan when you move to your commercial space because your overhead in both rent, uh, taxes, TICAM, all these things associated with commercial space and your labor are going to go up really fast. Um, so you better have a plan for revenue. So it's kind of like pick your pick your path. Either stick to being a solopreneur and you can make pretty good money as a yeah. side hustle or as a full-time job. Just don't employ anybody. Stay in your yeah. garage. You could, you could probably make six figures. You probably yeah. do in my, in my estimate 150 to 200 trades by yourself in a garage and you'll be tired at the end of the week. but you make freaking money, yeah. um, or go full tilt all the way in full time if you can. Quit your job, you know, like any other entrepreneurial story, and hire people and scale. Um, but don't like half-ass the middle because you'll you'll die. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I tried, tried, I tried the middle. <laughs> uh, I did for a long time the solopreneur. I think I it was crazy. Like the amount of hours I worked. Looking back, uh, I think I I had to keep in mind I was focused on automation, so I like started on make watering. Mm -hmm seeding uh harvesting all that stuff um but i think i was able to get to like close to 400 trays a week on my wow. own having said that there were some very very long days and i had help yeah. on harvest days so it wasn't like yeah it wasn't like i was doing everything alone um but i would not recommend anyone to have that experience it's not the way i would want anyone to live their life it was uh uh not sustainable is a simple way to put it yeah. absolutely not sustainable uh and yeah. i'm glad as difficult as it was that I went down the path of hiring people because it allowed the business to expand much more rapidly after that, because I could focus on the things that um, actually were driving the business forward, uh, yeah. you know, rather than like the day-to-day -day operations. Um, yeah. but I have a couple other questions for you that yeah. um, are, I'd, I'd say, you know, on topic, but kind of off topic related to expansion. Um, the gap mm -hmm. certification, I think is some, something that's becoming much more common in the industry. Yeah. And a lot of people are really starting to see the value in it. And then on top of that, I think there's more customers that are requiring it, especially as you mm -hmm. rise up the scale of customer types mm -hmm. and distributors. Uh, even some retail chains are starting to require it. Um, and yeah. then th that will probably happen more and more over time. So I'd love to hear your experience on gap, getting GAP certified. If you used a consultant or you, you did it on your own, how long yeah. that process took. 
the the whole shebang yeah, the about, whole game uh, it. yeah yeah so um man i get so dorky about these things like learning about gap like as soon as we got hgap certified <laughs> michelle's walking by <laughs> i'm like laughing because as soon as we got our, our gap on it and the we got like the tentative approval i was like okay how do we get gfsi certified um so <laughs> yeah, yeah i know what you mean yeah for, for for the for the people that are unfamiliar with gap gap is good agricultural practices in your if you're in if, if you're in the states it's offered by the usda and um they used to offer it in canada it sounds like they don't anymore and it is a voluntary program meaning unlike FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, which you have to legally comply with once you reach a certain revenue or distribution kind yeah. of scale, um, it's totally voluntary. It is a market-based program, meaning you, you opt into it because a buyer is asking it of you, just like organic. You don't have to do organic. You just do organic because you think you can charge more and make more money and yeah. sell more customers. So m- most of the time, it shows up when you start to get involved with intermediaries. I've never had a chef. I don't know about you. I've never had a chef or a restaurant go, oh, you know, what's your food safety like? What's your gap? We need gap, right? Nobody cares. Um, a farmer's market probably won't do it either. No. So it's generally when you involve an eating intermediary and that's because the end buyer wants some transference of trust and they trust the USDA more than they trust a buyer, that, uh, a grower right. that they're never going to meet. And when you start looking at gap, there are slightly different types of gap. There's gap specifically for mushrooms, for tomatoes, for aquaponics, um, and for a few other things. Um, and there are certain like categories within gap. So there's the harvest step or the production step, uh, like field production. There's the harvesting or pack house. And then there's post harvest handling. Unless, I don't know about you, because I think at some point you uh, would wash your sunflower shoots, yeah. which would probably be considered post-harvest handling. Since we don't wash our greens in any way, we did not have to comply with or fulfill or go through the hoops of the post-harvest like category uh, of requirements. So we only had to do the general. Everybody has to do general, and we had to do the harvest slash pack house. Um, there's probably more categories for those other niche types of certifications. But beyond the specific uh, like categories within GAP, there is GAP, at the lowest tier of uh, stringency. Then there's harmonized gap, which is what we did. And there's uh, HGAP, HGAP plus. And HGAP plus, I believe, is the highest tier within USDA. And remember, this is all a a, a United States scheme. This is a USDA-created audit program adjacent to that and much more respected by everybody is the Global Food, Global Food Safety Initiative, GFSI. That is, again, a private organization that basically provides the standards to what I believe is only about 8 to 12 national and international companies that do the auditing and the certifying on behalf of GFSI. Just like USDA didn't come audit us, it was the North Carolina Department of Ag or someone else that audited us as, again, an intermediary to the USDA. Got so um, the when you start to get to, to bigger buyers like Trader Joe's, Wegmans, um, Whole Foods sometimes, like certain known chains will accept regular gap. Some require age gap, but some require a GFSI equivalent certification. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is a whole other world. Yeah. Um, so I joke that like gap is pretty easy. H gap is not that much different. H gap plus I don't think is that much different than than what we've already uh, jumped through. But to get GFSI certified, that's um, like Kian Culture I believe is GFSI certified. Um, that's like there's no there's no higher higher uh, tier that if if you're not getting I mean there might be like other barriers to international shipping, but uh, or or if Kian Culture wanted to. Uh, as he said in his podcast, get into across the border into New York. Yeah, that there might be some like cross border issues. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, Gap is yeah, voluntary program done by the USDA. There's different tiers, and every year I hope we we go up. I hope next year we do HGAP plus, and the following year we can do GFSI. And as far as timeline cost and consultant, the cost for the audit services themselves. Um, that's the auditor coming, 
and then paying the USDA for our certificate. It's about a thousand or twelve hundred dollars. And for the first year, North Carolina offers nine hundred dollars in cost share, oh, and great. then they offer three hundred, and then three hundred, and then on your fourth year, no more. Um, as far as timeline and consultants, we worked with the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association (CFSA). So they they operate in both Carolinas. They are wonderful. I cannot say enough good things about them. I originally learned about them from someone at the farmer's market when they were hosting their, their annual um, ag conference in downtown Durham, of which I've attended and spoke at. Um, wonderful people. You pay like $40 a year for a membership. And Jay, who was both my moderator at last year's conference and our consultant for the whole gap process, is a great guy. I'm sure I had so much, so much paranoia and anxiety because you don't, you don't know your first year how. Yeah strict the auditor is going to be like i don't know i didn't know if they were going to come in here and just go yep check 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 or if they're going to go and test me you know like kind of kind of deliberately do something good that goes against uh conventional food safety or food safety plan and then we were going to kind of catch them like i was so paranoid yeah. and i'm sure jay on our many calls was like bro what is wrong with this guy he's like <laughs> um <laughs> But I brought up, I reached out to them and I said, hey, we want to get GAP certified once we're in our new space. This is our rough timeline for getting into our new space. And we started to work together around January 1st. And the biggest thing, aside from uh, quenching my anxiety and answering my questions, was that you have to have a food safety plan. And for us, as a yeah. very simple farm, right? Remember, we're not, we're not dealing with animals, compost, surface water. The 9 out of 10 other factors that would contribute to food safety... Our food safety plan was 80 pages. Uh, yeah. And so that's without a post-harvest handling category. That's without surface water. That's without animals, compost, all these factors. They really just left kind of the human component for mitigating food safety. And so they just provided us a sort of rough template of the food safety plan that had all the categories for each of the sections and subsections that GAP was going to look for and the right language. And all we had to do was swap in like our address, our particular policies and procedures for you know, what chemicals we were using to clean and how we were cleaning. And keep in mind, this is not SOPs. This is not, yeah. this is how we clean trays. This is, you know, after each production cycle, we soap, rinse, and sanitize with Sanidate at this dilution ratio in this way. Um, and it would have, it already took me months and months to read through that 80 page document many, many times to keep tweaking the language. And as we move into the new space, buy the right equipment and train the team and do the chemical training and have the right um, MSDS is on file and all these things. And it still took four and a half months, five months to, and, and, and like I said, I, I don't do much production anymore. So I spent half of my time every week, at least going through that. Wow. So it does wow. take time. I yeah. also chose to start us off with age gap. So I, I yeah. chose to start us off with no real reason to start with age gap. I just said, I want to be better than entry level and I want to start us off on a higher tier. And I did not have anybody in my mind that I was like, this person, this buyer requires age gap over gap. Um, I just had that higher standard for us. Um, so yeah, it took, it took five, five and a half months. Uh, the explicit cost was only $1,500, but the implicit cost of buying certain additional things for the farm, little tools, different chemicals. And then obviously all the time that I sunk into it in training my yeah. team and stuff is 10, 10,000, 20,000 plus, you know, yeah. immeasurable. Yeah. Um, we actually, and, and, um, go ahead. Well, one, one, one small thing is that, like I said, we, we kind of started this while we were, re, we were remodeling the space and Gap was updating their, their policies that they were going to push in April or May. So like as soon as we wanted to, about the time we wanted our audit and we were moving in, they were going to update their policies. Wow. And so we had to sort of um, proactively make sure that our policies and the, the infrastructure of our commercial space would be compliant with those, those, new, those new modifications. Yeah. And a, a big obvious one was that we demoed everything in the space except for the bathroom. The bathroom door was oriented outward as in facing our racks. And one of the small language changes said that in your pack house, if you have a bathroom, that bathroom door cannot open up into your to face your production for obvious sort of particulate matter yeah. um, cross contamination reasons. So we would have either had to build an L shaped bump out that would have you know blocked that flow of air from the bathroom door, which would have long term would have been terrible because it would have 
totally demolished our main aisle way. Yeah. Or we had to bump out the bathroom anyway to be ADA compliant. So we just, we just removed the door, patched it up, and then relocated that door to not face our production area. Mm. So if you're considering expanding and doing any sort of renovation and you know you want to get GAP certified immediately or thereafter, do those things in conjunction. Um, like we yeah. took certain language from GAP and we gave it to our GC. We said, hey, we need to make sure like all of our overhead lighting is new. We said, hey, there can't be a single piece of glass or like breakable material in our facility uh, because if it does, it's going to rain down on our product and that is not, you know, that's not loud. Yeah. Um, so doing those things in conjunction was uh, was critical. Having having Jay actually visited, he's in Greensboro. He drove down here and he visited the space partway through construction. He met our GC. Uh, so they big, yeah, big no, help there. Yeah, no, for sure. I think I think that's really really good advice. If anyone is looking at Gap and uh, planning to expand, it's like find out what you actually need for Gap and how. Like even if you don't get it right away, if you have it everything ready, uh, then you know you're kind of just pushing a button at that point yeah. rather than like. So, so, but having said that, it does change, but it's not often. Like I know with Certified Organic, it, every five years they review it, and then you know there's minor changes mm -hmm. pretty much every five years. There was a period where there was like major changes to, uh, uh, you know, the organic Certified Organic rules in Canada, which like became a huge kind of pain. Uh, but if like you know, it's not often that there's going to be change. So if you look at the current gap, it's going to give you like ninety eight percent of what you yeah. need to know and yeah. do. Um, so it, it's a good thing to, to, you know, if you're planning to go down that route, figure it out now. So when you do expand, you know what you need, because otherwise you're going to pay double. You're going to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, whatever, expand into a space, make some changes and then have to potentially make changes again. So as an example, I'm guessing fluorescent lights are all like the, this, a lot of these warehouses mm -hmm. have fluorescent ceiling lights because they're, yeah. you know, especially if they're not brand new. Um, yeah. and they all, they're all made of glass and mm -hmm. quite hazardous, a gaseous material yeah. of mercury and stuff inside it. Yeah, yeah. So like. You know, if to be, uh, you know, gap certified, you can't do that. It's better to, to know that beforehand rather than like yeah. go in and be like, okay, this doesn't need to be changed because some things, some some things are like changing a light bulb, pretty easy. Changing yeah. like you know a door to the bathroom, it yeah. starts getting up there. And but like if there's like bigger things you have to change, uh, like where the bathroom is, like if it can't mm -hmm. be in the production space, like yeah, that's like a pretty expensive thing to change. Thanks, yeah. So so it's better to know that in, in advance. And this goes back to your other point of like hiring people uh before because like if you didn't hire people before you would have been managing production trying to do this gap certification managing expansion figuring out all the things that needed to happen after expansion including sales and everything else like i can't imagine how no. that's stressful yeah. that, that would be yeah yeah the the one the one final um fun fact i suppose that i discovered about gap was when our auditor came i asked her and however much we trust her answer is that shoot for shoot for age cap, and if you mess something up, you can still get gas. Like you can on audit day, if uh, if you if you like, just because you fail something that age gap requires, does not mean you fail something that gap requires. So you can always yeah. kind of bump down, and I think you can also bump up, but I'm sure that's a lot Harder. trickier to yeah. be like, oh, we're yeah. gonna get age cap, but we want to try for plus. Um, but if we failed something that was critical to HCAP and not critical to GAP, we could have still got GAP certified. Uh, yeah. So if you want to put in the extra effort to try to shoot for the stars and and you land on the moon, as they say, then yeah. that's also possible. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and and from what I've heard is that like there's oftentimes you don't you may not like pass uh, and then because the, the auditor's going to have like mm -hmm. all these things are up for interpretation a lot of time. Maybe with food safety, it's a little mm -hmm. bit easier than with uh, certified organic because mm -hmm. there was so much like vague language that made it difficult to understand what actually needs to be done um but but, but like you know if, if you fail once you can still get another audit and keep like you can keep yeah. going through that process right if there's something that is missing. you'll have to repay for the, the yeah. you know for the, audit. the audit fee which is 155 dollars an hour it's not cheap and you pay for travel time um Got it. But yeah, yeah you can you can retry i don't know if they have a uh a minimum wait time like if you were to fail, I don't know if you could turn around and request another audit for the next week, uh, assuming yeah. they were available. There's only two auditors or three auditors for the whole state of North Carolina. Um, wow. So okay. There's, yeah. there's job security there. So if I, it doesn't yeah. work out, I'll become an auditor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know everything now. So like, <laughs> yeah. There you could. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on, which um, uh, which I'm excited to hear, because uh, I think a lot of people may be interested 
in the automation side of, of expanding, going from a garage where you don't yeah. have necessarily room for certain types of equipment to going into commercial facility where you do. And generally, as you scale up, it makes more and more sense to get this type of equipment. So I believe when we're on the last podcast, I don't know if you were using the Quick Cut Greens Harvester yet, but I believe, are you, are you using, is that something you're using <laughs> regularly now? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, right, when we think about like routine tasks that are automatable, there is, well, generically there's lighting, which is very easy. You buy a $10 outlet timer from Home Depot. Yeah. Uh, very easy. Then there's climate control, which most AC units are having yeah. a humidistat and a thermostat and they can kind of control yourself. On top of that, obviously, most farms need some sort of uh, additional specialized dehumidification, depending on your climate. So we have two Quest units that, that um, quite frankly, it's generally in the mornings, almost 100% humid outside. Um, so we're struggling right now in the summer to keep our space below 60% relative humidity. Like yeah. It's generally pretty humid here. <laughs> and that gets at your reference to the Quick Cut, which is something we bought with grant money back in the garage farm. And we have not been able to use it much because our plants are too wet on harvest day mm-hmm. to okay. effectively use it. So we still hand harvest everything. Um, watering is not something I decided to automate here. And you can maybe debunk my perception. But I think watering is one of the most, if not the most expensive thing to automate. Depending on whether you're doing a flow-through system or a recirculating system like Boston Microgreens, you tend to need extra floor drains. And then you tend to need, um, like I think Boston Microgreens uses wire racks, but you tend yeah. to, most people tend to get pallet racks. Yeah. And then you need sumps, pumps, valves, flood tables. And by my calculations, when we have three racks deep to, you know, sets back to back, so a six rack system, that to build the same system, the same capacity for the flood and drain system or a, a, an automated watering system, I think it costs a few thousand dollars extra. Um, and that's not considering the additional floor drain, which would cost ten to twenty thousand dollars in, in oh, additional wow. renovation costs. Yeah. So, as much as I want to do it, um, my perception is that it's still one of the most expensive things to uh, automate. So it's not something we're doing here, but maybe when we move in, if we move into the space next door in a couple of years, that's something we can, you know, that would be the time to lean into that. Yeah. And then that really leaves cleaning trays and filling trays and planting. And so I know you're working on a way to automate or semi-automate, mechanize the the seeding process. Yeah. For now, uh, we have the Stilt Pro, which I know Greener Roots has in in uh, Tennessee. And I think Pinky's, Pinky's Micros in Tennessee also has one, and I've seen a few other farms. And it's wonderful. It's certainly not uh, perfect as uh, like a dinky or whatever it is you use yeah. where you can easily mix in fertilizer or you know have a conveyor belt that you can kind of load it on and then load the next one and then load the next one it's but at least the machine you referenced me to is five times bigger it's only a couple thousand dollars more uh, but it's five yeah. times of a bigger footprint yeah, than the still yeah. pro so the still pro is incredibly compact mm. so kudos to that team um that for eight thousand, nine thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, maybe with with wheels and freight and everything, it takes up only about a five by five spot, and you can fit a full compressed bale in there. I wish the hopper was a little bit bigger, but aside from that, it runs on one fifteen volt. It takes up very little space, and yeah, it's a little dusty. But um, we roll it outside on an extension cord. We close our, our roll up door and we do it outside, and it's. Wonderful. We we went from doing 100 trays a week with, and again, this is something I stole from Pinky's Micros. Is he got a uh, a like drywall contractor like spackle paddle that has the that you put into like a drill bit and you use it to mix like a five uh, yeah, gallon yeah. bucket of spackle. Yeah, yeah. So with an eight, with an 18 volt drill, which most people have for home home DIY purposes, you put in a spackle paddle as a as a drill bit basically, and you dump your compressed bale into like a garbage bin, and then yeah. you just blend that up. And that little thing that costs 75 bucks for a new drill and a spackle bit, genius. Yeah. So yeah. kudos kudos to Pinky's Micros. We stole that. Anybody who's looking for like the first step into making tray filling easier, do that. Do that today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and even with that, we could do maybe 100, 110 trays an hour. 
and you'd be you'd be really tired afterwards. Oh yeah. Now with yeah. the Stilt Pro, we can do three, four hundred trades an hour. It's just like you just go. You're not yeah, tired. Yeah. It actually takes longer to nicely stack the tray after you pull it out of the you know after you scrape off the soil and pull it out of the machine to to nicely align it with the other nine trays before you compress them. It takes longer to just like carefully place it on the stack than it does to run it through the machine. So the bottleneck is still actually not the machine. It's yeah. It's like kind of the the other things, but we can do three or four hundred trays an hour. Or so that machine will solve our our tray filling problems for years to come. And then we recently bought the Bootstrap Farmer tray cleaner, which um, I know a lot of people as soon as it came out, yeah, complained about the price. We're skeptical about the features and why there was no conveyor belt. And you know, it's funny, nobody had a good solution for this. Yeah, everyone just kind of like had these crappy DIY, myself included. I tried to pressure wash on my driveway. It's hilarious the dynamic of economics and people because everybody complained about tray cleaning. It, it, universally, it's the least favorite part of running an indoor farm. Nobody had a good solution, and then Bootstrap Farmer came out with a solution, and everybody just tore it apart. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and then as soon as it came out, you immediately had YouTubers and and farmers and videos come out of like. Oh, Bootstrap Farmer does it for, you know, four grand. Here's how I rebuilt it with, you know, $500 or $300 of parts from Home yeah. Depot. And that's what I love about, I guess, capitalism and, and innovation is like, you know, it's just funny. So we bought one. I think we were one of the first 20 people to buy one. Obviously, there's not a lot of reviews out for it and there's not a lot of content out for it. So now that we kind of got it sorted, I'm excited to start making content so that we can hopefully be a point of reference for people. All in, it's about thirty eight hundred for the tray cleaner. We spent about seventeen hundred on a commercial pressure washer, and we worked with a, a, a distributor of Landa pressure washers, which is what Bootstrap recommends. Um, so these are not the types of pressure washers that you're buying at Home Depot. Even yeah. if you're buying a commercial pressure washer from Home Depot, this is like these pressure washers are meant to be used at like commercial hog farms to like clean out. You know, like they're yeah. they're meant to be run for hours and hours every week for years on end. This is not Home Depot. Um, no offense to Home Depot, yeah. uh, and you're not paying that much more. So I would say go find. And these people were also very knowledgeable on pressure and volume and output and flow and all the things you need to know um, if you don't want to know them yourself. So four thousand dollars, thirty eight hundred on the tray washer, seventeen hundred on the pressure washer. And then we bought a cart, like a, a sturdy cart to put the tray washer on instead of just using a folding table. So we can just roll it in and out of our shed. Yeah. Um, although they're like kind of nuances. We had to buy our retractable hoses are 9 16 inch, which only puts out three and a half uh, gallons per minute, which our pressure washer is five gallons per minute. So we okay. had to buy a larger diameter hose to make sure that we had enough. So all these little things adds up to the, the solution of tray cleaning is uh, is probably $8,000. So pretty similar to the Still Pro, which I think is where we're getting to as far as these like middle solutions where you don't want to spend $150,000 on yeah. a Hamel, you know, uh, a Hamel automated harvester. Yeah. That there's more and more companies, um, yourself included in the near future, coming out with solutions that are like the quick cut somewhere around $1,000 up to you know, ten or fifteen thousand dollars for a middle ground solution for people that are producing three hundred to a thousand trees per week, which yeah. is awesome. Like it's it's cool to see that our industry is developing that way. Yeah. Um, so hopefully I'll release more content on social media over the next couple of weeks and months about the tray cleaner. So far, it seems great. Obviously it's not perfect, but um, I'd say there's a lot more there were a lot more challenges and things to test and discover with getting that set up than with the still pro. Um, so again, big big kudos yeah. to the Still Pro. Uh, that thing, aside from small tweaks that I would make to like the hopper being a little bit bigger, so it's not so hard to fit a full bale in, little things like that. That um, is a really good product, um, especially if you're if you're space limited. Yeah, yeah, I, I've noticed that like every piece of equipment I've bought that's like you know a major piece of equipment, so yeah. mixing machine cedar there's always like a learning curve with how to use yeah. it and how to best optimize using that piece of equipment so i think people might have the and this happens a lot with the the quick cut greens harvester especially because like you know like you said if the greens are wet it doesn't really work so uh, or it doesn't work well so like yeah. 
that's not stated anywhere on like you know farmers yeah. friend <laughs> like you know like hey this won't work with wet greens but like yeah the, 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 there is no perfect solution it's like for example the cedar like that, mm-hmm. that we're making it's going to work on like soaked pea and sunflower but people are asking about like hey can i soak broccoli seed or basil or whatever and it's like there's no, there's nothing that yeah, yeah. will be able to exist that can actually be able to handle like wet, sticky seed. Yeah. It's, 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 there, there, there's no, no equipment exists in the world for that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. it's like there's certain things that are like, you know, if you're, if you're trying to uh, work against physics, like if you have sticky yeah. seed, like yeah. maybe if you had like an air blower before or some like very right. complex thing to dry them out before they go through, but it's just not practical. So, um, you yeah. know, people have to understand that, that, you know, uh, equipment is meant to make things as efficient as a possible, as possible, but there will be, things that you need to figure out how to optimize. And especially when there's something new, like it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that the bootstrap yeah. uh, thing is not perfect, but it sounds like it's making things a lot faster. And generally yeah. speaking, the trays are coming out clean is what it sounds like. Yeah. Is that, yeah. So, so like, and yeah. then like you, the, maybe a, sl- uh, maybe a different pressure washer or a different hose size or what, whatever could fix these type of small issues. But the point is that it's much faster and you don't have to like try to create one yourself because you know, you can't like, again, you can't like, I, I tried to uh, go down that route for a very short period of time. And then I got a custom made one. But if I was yeah. a farmer today, I would just buy the bootstrap one. I wouldn't start like trying to get a custom made tray washer or build yeah. one myself. Like it just doesn't make sense. Like your time is yeah. much better utilized elsewhere. Um, and then just going back to the uh, watering, I, I, I do like it, it depends on your situation. So you can semi automate watering pretty inexpensively but you make a good point that if you're not using pallet racking you have to buy pallet racking to make it work because like you know you like boston migraines does do it without pallet racking so it's not yeah true necessarily but yeah. generally speaking if you're going to automate wiring you want to use four by eight tables it doesn't make sense to use smaller yeah. ones yeah generally speaking i think the flip side to that though is like if you use pallet racking you can go floor to ceiling a lot easier than you can with true. the the rack so there are advantages disadvantages it, it the, yeah the pallet racking is not cheap uh but if you buy it used it's much less expensive because new pallet racking is cr- is crazy how expensive it is yeah. um and then there's like a, a question of uh for some people consistency um so all mm-hmm. this type of equipment whether it's watering uh seating machine uh you know the uh uh the still pro or yeah. uh the, the the uh the bootstrap tray washer like all these things will allow generally speaking should allow for a lot more consistency and consistency yeah. allows your employees to not have to be as uh you know not i don't want to say skilled but they, they don't need the same level of attention or training yeah. to you so if like if you're someone's sitting by hand uh you know you have to tell them okay you have to like do it in this pattern they do it this way they need this amount of steed versus yeah. like if you use a little green city machine you say okay put this wheel size this roller roll it across the table like it, yeah. it, it, it makes things simpler. So tray washing, instead of being like, you have to get every little piece of dirt off, you can just push it through. You don't have to think right. about it. It just works. Right. So it's, it's like, almost like, it's almost like the, the, if you look at these, these six or seven tasks, right. That are routine, monotonous, every farm deals with them. Yeah. It's almost like the, the greater the potential variability in the outcome, i.e. you can, forget to water or you could swamp your trays and everywhere in between the more variability the more expense the more nuances and the more expensive it is to solve that solution uh solve that problem so like there's not really that many ways you can mess up tray cleaning like you could under clean it but as long as you scrub it like we're all used to scrubbing our dishes and you know putting them in the dishwasher like the variability there is extreme and the difficulty and knowledge you need to have and capital you need to have to solve tray cleaning is actually not that much yeah. compared to converting your whole farm to being automated watering. But like you said, the, the amount of consistency and reliability you need in watering is much greater than you do in tray cleaning. So. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you have an outbreak of Pythia because then it might be. It yeah. Might be, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Like, like, yeah. Tray washing is a pretty, you know, it, it's a pretty simple a uh, task where like it's hard to screw up where like watering it's so yeah. soil mixing as well seeding like these things like there's humor error. like we've had even with soil mixing machinery we've had uh like training new staff where they put in double the amount of fertilizer you know like mm. like there is things that can uh yeah. uh you know mistakes that can be made with equipment but it reduces the odds yeah. of those mistakes happening um and sometimes those mistakes can be very costly like if you just think about it let's say you had uh um someone that like you know 
let's say seeded, I don't know, like like Trey's half the amount that they were supposed to uh, because yeah. th- they read the wrong, like in your list of like how much to seed, they read the r- wrong one. Um, and then you had this big or let's say you're doing 200 trade. Like that could cost more um, yeah. than, than, than it, th- like, you know, like one time can cost more than, than some of these like things you can buy to prevent right. these type of things. Right. So, uh, you know, scale makes a big difference. So if you're at a large scale, that one mistake can be very expensive. If you're running 20 trays, it's usually not going to be that expensive of a mistake. So, um, yeah. yeah, but I'm glad you're going down the road of, of uh, you know, checking off all the different, you know, main tasks of the farm, getting them, getting them automated. Cause I think that's, that's the, the way of the future it allows your staff, especially with soil mixing is one that is very tiresome, um, you know, yeah. on the body to do it by hand for like, you know, three, 400 trays, and then plus, as you expand, yeah. uh, you know, throwing a bale in, listening to some music, putting some yeah. trays through, it's way easier on, on staff as well, which is something you don't necessarily think about yeah. when you're when you're starting out. I I joke with my I joke with my staff, especially our newest hire Tilo. He's been here about eight weeks, and actually, it was it was when he did his onsite interview that we had just got the Stilt Pro. He's like, well, he was as the as a applicant, he was like one of the first people to use the Stilt Pro. And now he's been around for like eight weeks, 10 weeks, and we have the tray cleaner. And he has cleaned a good amount of trays in his time already here. But I joke with each subsequent hire where they fall in the automation purchase process that I'm like, you you don't know what it's like to, yeah. to be standing in the yeah. rain, cleaning trays with two dirty buckets of water, like... It's cold as shit out. Like you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You'll never know. Um, so it's it feels good to to be able to solve those problems for your employees and to know that future future employees will never have to stand at a sink for twelve hours over two days, you know, bent over yeah. in an uncomfortable position cleaning trays for twelve hours straight. Um, that they can set up the tray cleaner and knock it out in an hour and um, just the quality of life is better yeah yeah i think like there's there's so many like you know i I, first of all i had the exact same experience like whenever we bought something new and then we the next person we hired they like you know i think tray washing is a big one because people don't like tray washing but i remember i used to have employees like like ah like who's doing tray washing today and it's like you have no (laughs) idea what it was really like i used to do it in like a shower i'd be soaking wet with like dirty (laughs) clothes with soil and stuff it's like they'll never know, but like that's what it is. It's like a you know a kid that grew up in the ninth in the eighteen hundreds has you know like all these crazy experiences of like how much different life was, and yeah. then now like you just push a button and your dishes are clean, or you like call someone yeah. and they bring you soil to your to your house. You yeah, know, yeah, it's just like it's the same kind of thing. We're just advancing society and like on a micro level, advancing our businesses to to be the way that involves uh, less less difficult human work. And more yeah. ideally brain capacity type of work where, you know, h- how do we solve these complex problems in, you know, in our businesses and society uh, and make people's lives easier? Because I think that's what uh, everyone would love right. to be sitting on, on, a, on, a, on a beach, drinking a pina colada, running their microgreens business on their phone with robots, yeah. like, you know, doing yeah. everything like it'll, it'll happen one day. That, that, that's for sure. Yeah. When? I don't know. But <laughs> and, I, and I think the last like point on automation that's important is you can do the cost benefit analysis of if I buy this still pro for nine grand and it takes like it, it pays itself back explicitly in a year on saved labor. What if, what if you were to lose an employee during that time because they go screw this. I don't want to work 40 hours spending 20 hours a week, cleaning trays and 20 hours a week, filling trays like this is miserable. Yeah. And the cost of that turnover. I know people say, um, hiring an employee costs something like nine months or 12 months of that employee's pay in terms of payroll and severance and um, onboarding and training and all these things. And maybe that's true, but it, it, it does have an implicit cost there that you're not factoring in to the payback period of that piece of equipment that, yeah, it, it, take, it just takes time to, yeah. to train someone. So if you can make employee life better, um, and I know I, people are... I think people, when they don't think about it, say they're only driven by money. Like, oh, I'll definitely, I would definitely take a higher pay for a less satisfactory, worse ergonomic work environment. But then you put them in, in, in that context and you go, I, you know, put them in a similar context where you pay them a little bit less, but their work environment is way more pleasant 
I guarantee you nine employees out of 10, unless they're in a desperate financial situation, will take less pay and oh, a yeah. more satisfactory work environment, both by the management that they have to work with and the tools and equipment and things that they have to do. So um, there's so much more to buying good equipment and, and automating and, and increasing the ergonomics and satisfaction of your employees than the explicit cost of payback for saved labor. Yeah, I, I think I think that's that's a, that's a great point because like you know as I'm you know uh, trying to figure out like what how, how to express the value of the cedar because like I I understand the value but it's like how do you yeah. express that from a marketing spec perspective to people um, yeah and then like like I, so I've been thinking about this and I think that's that's a very good point is like you know you don't realize how. Uh, stressful it can be to have an employee leave and then all this extra work falls on you and your other employees. And it could be this like yeah. potential, uh, you know, I don't want to say downward spiral, but it can make it more difficult for everyone, like team morale, a lot of different things. Um, and then you, you, when you have it easier to, uh, you know, operate the farm, the less you rely, like the less mm -hmm. uh, difficult it becomes when someone does leave, but more, more yeah. importantly, like what you, what you just pointed out about um, uh, li like like how, how difficult how enjoyable the work actually is that they're doing because like yeah you know but, but for in canada there's an industry called the oil sands which is where like the oil comes mm -hmm. from out, out west like i've known people that have gone out there no one stays like they make tons of money yeah but yeah, it's yeah. like the worst work environment like it's the terrible like work environment like that you can ever think of um and like no one wants to do it for more than a year or two like people do it to yeah. make money and then leave but that's right. not a career right. that's just a job for a short period yeah. of time if you want people to work at your farm and it be their career, you got to make sure yeah. the job is at, like m more enjoyable than less enjoyable and ideally as enjoyable yeah. as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I will also be uh, remiss and my brother will also kill me if I don't uh, mention in terms of automation, the software that we're building. Yeah. So microgreen manager is something we've been working on for about a year and a half and it's been public. The, the beta is fully functional, fully usable. There's nothing that we are reserving for the paid launch. and my team and I use it every single day. It will be probably $20 or so a month in the next couple of weeks or months when we launch the paid version. And I do not have to come up with a crop schedule. Um, I give it the orders and I just tell my team to check the software. Mm -hmm. So Michelle planted like 250 trays this morning and Tilo weighed out all that seed this, uh, this last weekend. I didn't have to tell either of them how many trays of what varieties at what sowing density to do nor did I have to tell Michelle, like, obviously we know our big planting is Monday, but yeah. I have to tell her that today was the planting. She just goes and checks the tasks. Um, so that is also huge in that I think that's one of those things, kind of like watering, that it takes a long time to get the 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 rhythm of your farm. And as the owner, you, you understand that intrinsically, kind of like an outdoor farmer um, checks the weather, but has an intrinsic feel for soil moisture and what weather is coming down the next couple of days or weeks. And adjusting things accordingly that I don't have to sit here and go, oh, these people changed their orders or canceled or doubled um, or this crop is under yielding or anything like that. I can just change the parameters and software. And yeah. as my employees check the software, it's just it, it does all that for us. So, yeah, um, yeah, no, for that sure. That has been huge as far as offloading something that is like watering, very uh, hard to train. Yeah, no, I, I think the software for that, I think is, is invaluable, especially when you consider like, again, from even just from the pure economics of like, you have this, the software, let's just say hypothetically it's $20 a month. Um, that's $240 a year. That's really not that much money for the, like having your employees all be on the same page. You can remotely check that everything's like done, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like everything is in one place where, uh, you know, people can check, okay, what's the seeding rate? How many trades are you doing? You get an order that comes in and let's say hypothetically you or, uh, you know, your, your operations manager is, is, is dealing with the orders. Then one of the staff doing seeding will be able to see, okay, now this number is now higher yeah. this week, uh, you know, without having to communicate anything and spending time that you have to pay your employees to like send messages and go back and forth and all, yeah. like it's all done behind the scenes and it just shows up for you ready to, uh, for your employees to do the work. Yeah. So, you know, like software is such a powerful tool in so many yeah. ways um, that I think it's well worth the money to spend. So uh, definitely, definitely check that out for anyone that's, uh, you know, not using uh, software for, for those, those tasks. Definitely uh, highly recommend having some sort of tool for that. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to not use it, uh, you know, if, if it's available. Right. So it's like, yeah, just, just like any other tool it's created for that purpose. If it works 
and it's saving you time and money, it's well worth the, usually well worth yeah. the price. There's a reason it's yeah. created. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So yeah, so I think this was a, a very informative episode. Um, <laughs> I think uh, this for anyone that's in that phase or when they get to the phase, this is a great episode to listen to. So thanks so much, Garrett, for coming on. If uh, if anyone wants to uh, you know follow you on on Instagram or or, or check out you know the software, what, what, where can they where can they find that? Yeah, for PMG, I don't do YouTube or Facebook or anything like that. It's just it's all through Instagram. And I try to make, I try to make the content that I don't see, which is really just, yeah. like you said, tra- transparent about the challenges and victories and struggles of, of growing. And our website, we just redid it, but I, I, to be more sort of retail wholesale focused, but there is still a resource section. So if you're a farmer and you want to download those free resources, it has stuff about like our growth, growth parameters for all of our crops and the products that we use in our farm and things like that. Feel free to download those. Otherwise, the software, Microgreen Manager, you can just go to microgreenmanager.com. We also have uh, an Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, uh, Facebook for all that. And so generally, we reserve feature updates for the short form content platforms, including YouTube. And then when we have a bigger update or a more involved update, a more involved feature, we'll make a full length video on YouTube. And um, yeah, right now it's it's in beta. But like I said, we're not hiding anything behind some future payroll paywall. It is fully functional. Like I said, I use it for my farm and I have three employees and 300 trays per week. So it's more than capable of of handling your order management and trade calculations. And you can just go to the website and register an account and um, follow us on both. And yeah, hopefully it's helpful. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Gary, for coming on. And I'm sure we'll have another one at some point. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming on and sharing all your your wisdom from the last, uh, last year. Of course. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Microgreens businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.